Hi everybody, I'm Sumit. I work for Solace. I run the global systems engineering team. So before I kick off, I thought uh, it's become customary for us to talk about soap in the restrooms, but uh, it's been congested. I also saw queues there. So we'll talk a lot about asynchronity and queues and all. So with that, a uh, show of hands, so how many people here are developers or have developed some point in their lives? Okay, fantastic, almost everybody. How many people are from the operations side of technology? The ops? Relatively few, okay, uh, great. So this is, this is going to be a fairly technical talk. So I thought it's a technical track and uh, we would be going to some extent in code as well. So if I put you to sleep, just stop me. Uh, so just to introduce Solace, who's Solace? So we are a Canadian company. We've been around for almost 10, 12 years in business and uh, uh, you might not have heard of us, some of you might have heard of us, but I'm pretty sure all of you have used Solace in your lives at some point or the other. Uh, if you've ever flown to the US, for example, the entire US airspace, that data flows over Solace from uh, uh, airline data to weather data, everything. Uh, we are there in nine of the top tw uh, top 12 banks in the world. Uh, for those of you who are from Singapore, uh, if you've used Nets, we are the backbone for Nets, especially the QR codes, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And a wide variety of other customers. If you drive a Mercedes, we are the connected car platform for Mercedes. So what we do as a business, we move data. So we are a messaging and event brokering platform, and I'll explain that a little more as to how does that tie more and more with the API fabric. Uh, given that we're talking about open banking now, so just some uh, observations from my perspective. I think everybody believes in it, everybody has seen it, but this is somewhat how payments have evolved uh, for the past five odd years, right? So. Uh, it's become a lot of high volume, low value. So high value payments are still there, but uh, we are paying for our, uh, uh, for our TES Eco song with our uh, nets or our, uh, or our contactless payments with our phones. And uh, settlements have to be real time. T plus three is not good enough. Uh, historically, payment systems were built with service oriented architectures. Now it's all uh, event-driven or, or moving towards event-driven. Uh, that's, the, that's the requirement for real-time systems, for low-latency systems. And what used to be multi-year projects, again, all the speakers have been consistent by saying that it has to be uh, monthly or weekly rollouts. Uh, the bills have to go faster, right? So what are the challenges of moving from the 2015 model to the 2020 model technically? So if I just examine uh, the, uh, the service-oriented architecture as the core backbone for APIs, that is how APIs started to take off, uh, you would see that there's an enterprise service bus. So this is an architecture of a traditional payment platform where you have various steps of validations to core banking, to clearing gateways, et cetera. And these are orchestrated using, uh, using uh, and ESB, and then APIs are exposed. But the challenges here are, if you see that the ESB is going through all of these multiple steps, what if one of those steps goes down? And even if it is a non-essential step, it causes, uh, it causes errors to the invokers of the API. Similarly, if you decided to introduce new capability here, let's say you wanted to put new AI or machine learning uh, hooks into your existing flows, it's relatively difficult for you to do that because your payment platform is more of a monolith and to introduce that functionality into each and every flow is harder. And then going to the cloud again, uh, following the same challenge, it's equally hard. So an ESP approach was fantastic to move from a very batch oriented to a service oriented architecture. But as we, as we go towards a much more highly scaled, much more cloud native real time architecture, uh, the weaknesses of ESB being a bottleneck are also uh, being uh, observed. Uh, the analysts are talking about the next evolution from service oriented architecture. The industry is experiencing it 
experimenting it, putting it in production. So this is, for example, a slide from Gartner where they are saying that by 2022, 70% of the digital, uh, uh, of the new digital business solutions will become event-driven. Uh, IDC, as we heard them before, uh, earlier today, they are also saying the same thing. So event-driven is becoming the core backbone for real-time processing and APIs are not excluded from that. So how do we realize these event-driven architectures? Uh, for an event-driven architecture, you need an event broker and you can actually have a network of event brokers working in a distributed manner. So what does the event broker give to you? Uh, historically, it's uh, messaging. So I think most of you would have heard of or used IBM MQ. So that's the grandfather of event brokering. But then moving on from there, publish subscribe models, standards such as AMQP, JMS, if you're familiar with them, and even rest with publish subscribe. So those are some capabilities that event brokers offer. And how does the event broker or the event mesh world work with APIs? Uh, the API gateways are often the end point to expose these event-driven flows, right? So if you were to use uh, a payment API, the internal processing of a payment could be very event-driven, and the API platform could be exposing that as a simple blocking REST call to you. But then we are also observing a lot of these APIs evolving into event-driven themselves. So uh, the, the GovTech gentleman in the morning uh, was saying that how they have on their roadmap to actually push data to the invokers of the API, callbacks. And AMQP, and I'll talk about async API as a standard later, is serving up as a standards-based way of doing that. So an event mesh exposed using API gateways. And see, none of this is new. So uh, what, what Solace has been doing where we've been uh, gaining experience, where we've been helping customers has been in the capital market space. So if we look at open banking and if we compare and contrast it with trading platforms, whether it is foreign exchange trading platforms or whether it is uh, equities trading platforms, now we, we move a, a large majority of FX uh, data in the world and how, does all of, how do all of these electronic exchanges work with each other? It's all, it's, it's all without humans, right? It's all based on APIs and there are protocols like FIX which have been around in capital markets for a very long time. Swift in the payment systems have been around, but as they are becoming more and more real time, the open banking, the retail corporate banking world has started to mimic the performance characteristics of capital markets. So from tens of transactions per second to hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. So we call it the unnamed event mesh a broker of event, uh, uh, a, a network of event brokers in let's say an FX platform where if an FX price changed in New York, we instantly consume that price in Singapore and we buy the Singapore dollars against the US dollars. So data is flowing across multiple data centers in real time at very high scale and it's all electronically integrated between the banks. So. Solace, as I mentioned, is a backbone for that. And again, uh, I represent Solace, so I uh, thought I'll introduce this to you as well. So by the way, Solace is free for production use. Uh, we have various form factors, so you can run us on, on your laptops as a Docker container. You can run us on any public cloud that you like. Uh, we have a fully managed cloud service as well. And for the highest performance use cases, we also have hardware appliances. So. Uh, the LTA next generation ERP will be going live on these appliances. So if you drive in Singapore, your cars will be all connecting using MQTT over these appliances. So that's beyond banking, but that's also an API, uh, a, an asynchronous API based uh, communication. Right? So it's free for production. How do we make money? We make money uh, when you need performance, the enterprise and the appliances are what we make our money from. Right. So, uh, diving deeper into APIs now, so let's look at internal APIs. So I'll talk about internal, I'll also talk about external APIs. 
So again, if I dissect the payment platform, roughly this is how it will look like. So there is an initiation stage, and then you have validation, you have funding, you have risk, clearing, settlement. Uh, there could be other, other stages as well, like uh, getting a foreign exchange rate or uh, uh, entering data into an audit system. But that's the rough stages of a payment platform. And again, we could do the same thing for credit initiation. We could say do the same thing for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, transactional banking, like pick your favorite domain. And historically, many of these systems have depended on some sort of a database, some sort of a system of record. It could be a mainframe, it could be some DB2, it could be Oracle, uh, but database has been used as a state machine quite frequently. But disk, uh, disk is not the fastest component in a computer system. Networks are faster than disk. So if we use the disk as a stage sharing mechanism between our steps, we are going to get slow response time and we are going to get uh, the lack of agility. So even if you put an API here to expose this, those challenges are going to be there. So how do we modernize this platform? Uh, we, can, we can break it better, but then it's further made difficult to modernize because as we decompose, there are different payment rules by country, different payment rules by channel. So uh, my colleague from Zero was just talking about uh, how their payroll API, it's available in four flavors, although they strive to unify a lot of their other APIs. But in banks, the challenge is much worse. So for every country, there'll be a different set of systems. Every payment type, there'll be a different set of systems. The complexity is far greater. So we've got to do something here to improve agility and to improve response time. Enter microservices. So APIs as a mechanism to expose microservices. So it's a great start. And uh, we, we've heard several talks about microservices. So let's say we decomposed our entire ecosystem of payments. We removed the database. And we made these microservices talk to each other over APIs. So these could all be REST calls from validation to funding to risk to FX. Our network is potent enough, has enough bandwidth now to carry large payloads. We don't have to save everything to a database and then read from a database. Or even better, these could be messages. So you send a message over AMQP or you send a message over, if you're a Java developer, over Java, and there's a publish subscribe model going here. So we've broken the monolith, we've gained some agility. But if you look at the flow, our response time is still not great, right? So if we hypothetically uh, see like validation is 0.1 second, funding is 0.1 second, so on and so forth, the overall response time comes to 5.5 second. And that's the happy flow. What if my settlement gateway was slow or was down? This 5.5 seconds could become 50 seconds. That's bad customer experience. The customer is waiting for your API. The channel is waiting for your API for that time. And again, the compounding of that problem has not been solved because we've created those various swim lanes for each country, for each channel, for each payment type still. So lots of copy and paste reuse, but some problems remain. So how do we improve? Can we get better? So taken a good first step, moving on, can we use the power of topic routing, the power of wildcards? And again, none of this is solace proprietary. These are all standards. Pick your favorite event broker. Many of them would support these, right? So explaining that further, how many of you know topic routing? Ever heard of topic routing? Oh, quite a large bunch. Fantastic. So topic routing is all about having your payload, and the payload could be binary, it could be JSON, it could be anything, having your payload and having some metadata around it which describes the payload. Now this metadata could be a topic, it could be a JMS topic, it could be, uh, could be an AMQP topic, an MQTT topic, all of these are open standards. And it could also be a REST URL. So specifically in the Solus world, if you publish a REST API, you can consume it as an AMQP message. So your URL, as you can see, becomes the topic. 
the topic becomes the URL. So the example I'm taking here is, let's say, uh, QR code payments uh, for, uh, uh, for comfort taxis. So if you scan the QR code in a comfort taxi, it could be a REST API. So it could be host port pay. It's an initiation step. Uh, something happened in Singapore version one. It's a QR code. Uh, my bank is OCBC. It's a CASA transaction. So on and so forth. I've decorated my payload with, uh, with my URL. And then I can subscribe to it in various ways and in a one-to-many manner, which means I can have, let's say for my data warehouse, if I want a copy of all my payments, I can say pay slash greater than. So I don't have to think about my consumers today. Tomorrow a regulator might come and say, I want a copy of each and every, uh, let's say, the metal card transaction, all of them. So as long as you have that, instead of the QR code, you have that metal card in your payment type, you can just subscribe to it. So you start getting a copy of all of that while your core flow goes. So, so you, you get the point that you can use some of these wildcards, you can use asterisks where we are saying that give me all payment initiation steps, I don't really care which country, whether it is Singapore, Australia, India, I don't care. As long as it's an initiation of version one. For those of you who are familiar with A-B testing, you can even have various consumers, various microservices uh, consume different versions. Right? So you can have different payloads go uh, this way as well. So that's the concept of topic routing, of event routing. And how do we apply it to microservices? So what is a microservice? Independent of the language that you, that you implement in, whether it's in Go or it's in Spring, it's basically some business logic which subscribes to certain events or an API call. I, I like events because that makes it more agile. And then after it has done its business logic, it emits events. So this particular microservice, it's a validation microservice. That is this a valid payment? What it does is I'm subscribing to the initiation step, which came from the payment channel. This is QR code. So I can validate QR code kind of transactions. And once I say this is a valid transaction, I publish an event which says, yeah, it's valid, so that the next microservice who can consume the validated payments and can process it, let's say the funding one, can consume it. And my data warehouse, as I said, could just also say pay slash greater than. So it's a very publish subscribe nature of my business logic. The benefit I get with this is, I don't have to go and daisy chain everything ahead of time. I can streamline my flows. I can have them in various swim lanes by using the, the concepts of event routing here. And again, AMQP, MQTT, both standards support it, works with REST as well. Okay? So what do you get here? You get agility because tomorrow if you wanted to introduce a new step for payment initiation, let's say you wanted to, every payment that was initiated, you also wanted it to go to some sort of an AI or a machine learning platform, you can just subscribe to it. You can subscribe in a filtered manner, let's say only the QR code transactions, you want them to be handled differently. So you can easily choreograph your entire internal APIs rather than having them very static REST only uh, interfaces. So to give you an example, so let's say the QR code platform today supports the major banks in Singapore and uh, uh, the, the final gateway, let's say in the case of Nets, the final gateway, uh, and it's all hypothetical, this is not the real architecture, I'll get into trouble if I say uh, the details there, but uh, uh, to, to make the point, let's say the DBS gateway is written in Java, subscribes the uh, events in GMS, uh, UOB is AMQP, OCBC is REST, each of the gateways are subscribing to their specific transactions which are generated by the application uh, which is scanning the QR code. Now, let's say when WeChat comes in with VPay, how do we, how do we roll that out very, very quickly? So, it's fairly simple. We implement a 
WeChat gateway, rather the payment provider, the, the aggregator, uh, implements the WeChat gateway, which talks to WePay on the other side, subscribes to the topic, let's say settlement, uh, WePay as the payment type, and as long as the WeChat app in its REST URL, it is publishing WePay on that particular segment, that's it. Nothing else changes. So in two weeks, you've got a brand new payment channel onboarded onto your platform because you were using publish subscribe routing as the core API interchange for your microservices. Right? So a couple of more patterns. So we've talked about agility a lot. Now, how about response time? Right? So how do we improve the response time, which previously, as we saw, was five seconds at best, could be 50 seconds. Uh, so can we use patterns such as deferred execution? So again, from a protocol perspective, I talked about publish, subscribe. But if you look at any flow, whether it's a payment flow, whether it is, uh, whether it is an order management flow uh, in a telco, pick your favorite domain. If you look closely enough to any business flow, you can easily find that there are some components of that flow that must be serially processed, must be synchronous. Your credit check, your authorizations, your uh, core transactions, they must be done one after the other, and you can't respond to the customer till you go through those steps. So if I give you an example, an extreme case, we are deployed as the core backbone for Income Tax India. Like, what's the must be synchronous path when you do the e-filing, right? India has a very large population when, if you're, if you're an Indian like me, you'll always do things at the very last day. So uh, 31st of July every year, everybody goes and does the e-filing. So when that happens, there's a massive burst onto the system. But then, all the system needs to do is take my return, tell me that I've got it. The processing can happen later. Right? In the case of a payment, it could be your data warehouse, audit, logging, AI, machine learning. All of those things, they can be asynchronous. So if you look at your flows and you break them down such that you return after the must be sync flows. Very similar to if you, if you go to a restaurant, you place your order, your waiter will just say, oh, soup of the day is this, fish of the day is this, take your order. He doesn't wait for the kitchen before he moves to the next table. Right? It's the same part. So this is the waiter, that's the kitchen. So the, the technology that is required for the kitchen to work, why is it in red? It's persistent messaging. It's queuing. Right? So you return after the green part, and the red part is, uh, is deferred execution and eventual consistency. So your databases will get the data maybe one second later, and now your response time has become 10 times faster. And it's very consistent because all the slow consumers have been isolated. So again, revisiting the technology underlying this, the pattern, the uh, architectural foundational layer that provides you with this publish, subscribe, this streaming, guaranteed delivery capability across multiple clouds using open standards. Again, it's, it's defined as an event mesh, vendor agnostic, any vendor could do it. And uh, uh, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, interesting way of putting together your microservices, having their internal APIs uh, uh, orchestrated or choreographed. But then further improvement, we had our event mesh serially uh, linking these microservices. It could also be parallel. So why do we have to do all the eventual consistency step serially? And similarly, we could extend them easily to the cloud. Your events are just flowing. You just have to tap them in a guaranteed publish, subscribe, lossless manner. Right? So a couple of final points here. Uh, if the event plane is where the data is moving, uh, that's, that's the core of this. There is a control plane. So like in the case of APIs, you have API catalogs. There is a concept of an event catalog. And that work with API catalogs as well. So you can have uh, the APIs, uh, the API gateways, as they're evolving towards event-driven as well, 
the event catalog could be imported or could be, uh, could be synced up into them. In fact, we as a company are working with quite a few of the API Gateway partners to do that. So what's the impact for this external APIs? Internally, we can optimize, we can service our APIs in whichever manner, and we can still offer them as synchronous REST calls. But externally, if you're familiar with async APIs as a standard, this is a mechanism for uh, the APIs to be made available in an event-driven publish-subscribe manner as a callback push manner to external systems as well. So again, very swagger-based syntax. You can see that AMQP is the chosen protocol here. It could be REST, it could be MQTT, it could be any protocol. The ability to have data pushed to you rather than a blocking request reply call is what async APIs are all about. So the tooling can generate that code. And an implementation example, so foreign exchange prices, this is where I started. So foreign exchange prices can be pushed to you. You could be subscribing to it. Or it could be catalog-based prices pushed into you as a webhook. So moving from pull to push, moving from batch to real time. There are several advantages of doing that. And finally, concluding with open banking. So we have a partner who uses our technology. So you can see that there's the event gateway and the API gateway. Uh, so we, we sit as the core backbone underneath this. There's the service and the event mesh. So just stringing together a full core banking platform uh, supporting the open banking initiatives. And this has been developed very much as a bank in the box. So you can scale it up with nodes. Every time you have uh, a few hundred thousand more customers, you add a node. And uh, the, the event mesh and the service mesh just allow you to scale that. And you can also take it to the cloud. Right? So with that, uh, I just encourage you all to be event driven, think event driven. and. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm here or later outside. Thank you. Yeah, one question here. Someone else has a question? With the uh, architecture design around Event Mesh, can you talk about data consistency and what approach you take to ensure eventual or real data consistency? Yeah. So. As I said, right, if you, if you break your flow into various pieces, uh, there, are, there are some aspects of the flow that must be consistent before you reply. So, for example, if you're booking an air ticket, you have to get that ticket reserved for you. Eventual consistency will not work because somebody else would also be looking at that ticket. But then, as you've booked that ticket, your meal services, your loyalty points, all of those kind of services can happen a few seconds later, a few minutes later. So the mechanism that you take is anything that must be synchronous, you have blocking calls from one microservice to the other. And if it needs a database write, you have a database write done at that step. But for all the other steps, you use guaranteed messaging queuing. And the message broker, the event broker, like especially in the case of Solace, we guarantee that we will not lose a message ever. Even if you lost a database, even if you lost power, like there's high availability, disaster recovery, there are many mechanisms in place that we will not lose messages. So that's how we guarantee eventual consistency. From a latency perspective, it's down to the consumer, how quick the consumer can consume it, but uh, it's typically in microseconds. Okay, uh, one more question. So it's easy to split the message flow, but what about of combining it? Yeah. So great, are great there question. any ready uh, solutions for it? Yeah, great question. So combining the business flow, uh, so especially if we, if we use the parallel example, so as I was parallelizing these things, what if we expected them to send a reply back as well? After they've done their part, you send a reply back. In that case, you have to take a pattern where one microservice f serves as the aggregator. It watches out for all the messages, and once all the final message, uh, the, the final message comes in, then it sends a rec the reply back. So rather than serially daisy chaining it, you've created a microservice, and you're moving all of these business logic steps in parallel. But from a messaging perspective, from an eventing perspective, 
it's all topic routing. But the messaging or the eventing platform does not have the intelligence to know whether all the pieces have arrived or not. That's often down to the microservice because it's different for every flow. One more question. Yeah. You're mentioning about the ESB as a single point of failure in, in the SOA world, right? Uh, if I think the event mesh or event flow, I believe they are also happening by a messaging middleware similar to a service bus. So how different are, is this architecture from the ESB? Yeah, no, I'm, so again, uh, to, to clarify, I was not suggesting that ESBs are a single point of failure. I was saying that they are bottlenecks because any, po any, any technology could be a single point of failure and uh, you put high availability and disaster recovery redundancy models to avoid that. And the ESBs are mature enough that they are not single point of failures, but they are bottlenecks because they process, they process steps synchronously. And it's not because the ESB itself is the bottleneck, but if I have to write to a database as my ESB node step or to SAP or to mainframe, and if that node is slow, how long am I going to wait at that step before I throw an error back to the, uh, to the invoker of the API? And in that meantime, I assemble congestion. So what I'm suggesting is to introduce asynchronity as the core flow within an ESB, moving from orchestration to choreography. And if you look at the mature ESP vendors, they have had JMS as a core backbone forever. So I'm saying rather than just thinking HTTP, think JMS as well, or think messaging, think eventing, even if you were to use your ESB as your orchestrator for the must be synchronous part. I have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, just going back to the earlier question about uh, consistency. So you were saying uh, you guarantee the consistency. Is that at your hardware appliance level or is software based? Software as well. I mean, I can I can take you through the drill down. I don't want this to be a product pitch, but yeah, uh, we are the backbone of American Express credit cards. We are the backbone of Nets. We've we've done this enough times to to ensure that we don't lose messages, and and there are others as well like. MQ doesn't lose messages easily either. Okay. More questions? Yes, here. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, how do you make sure the, uh, the last step of your synchronous transaction will be always consistent with the message you send out? I mean, how do you generate that message when you finish the transaction? So, okay. Great question. We don't. The microservice does. So what happens is, let's say you, you invoke the first call as a REST call. You sent a message, right? Now that REST call went into the first microservice. It generated an event. You keep on going till the end, till you send a reply to that REST. So there is a special message, and it's a part of all these standards, request reply. When you generate a reply message, it either goes on a reply to topic if the invoker was using AMQP or uh, uh, any of the messaging protocols, or if the invoker was invoking a REST call, it'll go back as the 200 OK, right? So till that, the call is blocking. So if this microservice was misbehaving, and he, rather than sending events downstream, just published the reply to back, then that is where the reply will go back from. So when you put your flow together, when you choreograph your microservices together, you decide that, okay, I've validated and funded my transaction. I am now going to reply to the invoker of the API that I've got it, and the rest of the steps will be done later. So the eventing, the messaging broker, just gives you the ability, the tools to do the reply to and the topic routing. Does it make sense? So it's uh, so basically, it's in each step there will be a, a new message sent out, and the, the 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 business logic of all the later processes are based on those messages. Exactly. So, like in this case, you got a message on a topic. You did your business logic. You sent the next message out. Now, if this was the last message, you would send this as the reply, as a reply to. 
So that's how you modularize the whole thing. We're good? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for his talk. Yes, guys. A lot of questions. That's yeah, if there are more, I'll be outside.